take a group of people and connect them one way, and they're really sweet to each other. Or take the same people with their same inclination to be nice, but connect them another way, and they're mean to each other. Which means that the properties of niceness and meanness aren't only properties of individuals, they're properties of groups that can arise from the pattern of connections. Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson, coordinator of the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series and a professor here at the University of Hawaii. Um, today we're going to be talking about exciting research that casts new light on really foundational quandaries. Um, how did human beings become the social animals that we are? To what extent do our, have our genes um, shaped not only our biologies, but our social behaviors, um, our love lives, our friendships? even the shape of our civilizations. Um, and what sort of creatures are we anyway? Are we um, kind and cooperative, or are we predatory and competitive? These are the sort of questions that philosophers have wrestled with since the birth of philosophy. Um, but today, our guest, Nicholas Christakis, welcome. Thank you for um, so much for having me. He really brings to bear a insights from a dizzying array of fields, from anthropology to neuroscience and more. Um, he's visiting us from Yale, where he's director of the Human Nature Lab. Um, his teams over the years have made all sorts of breakthrough discoveries in network science, for example, on the social contagiousness of a whole range of seemingly individual behaviors, ranging from depression on the one hand to generosity on the other. He's the author of several books, including the best-selling Blueprint, which we'll be talking about mostly today. It's very nice to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I thought I'd talk start by just um, talking a little bit about the book and then going through the larger body of your research. Um, what made you decide to step out of the findings of your lab and to write a book that has such a grand scope as um, Blueprint does? Well, um, there's a sort of a personal motivations, which are that I'm, I'm an optimist and, um, and I marvel at human beings. It, 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 in addition to being an optimist, I'm sort of really impressed with our species. I think we're a pretty incredible species. And um, I've, I very much wanted to counter a kind of narrative that's very ascendant in, um, in the, among scientists, but is also very ascendant amongst uh, people on the street, which is a, a narrative that focuses on, on uh, the evil parts of human nature, mm -hmm. our propensity for violence and selfishness and tribalism and, um, and hatred. Um, and I think that this dark side of human nature gets far too much attention. And I think the bright side had been um, denied the attention it deserves. So I, I wanted to write about the origins of love and friendship and and altruism and kindness and teaching and all of these wonderful qualities, which in any case, as I mentioned a moment ago, were more in keeping with my own disposition. Well, and it's a, it's a lovely book in spirit for that reason, I found, because it is sometimes in gloomy and caustic and divisive times to yeah. sometimes lose sight of all the ways that we still sacrifice for one another and help each other and generally cooperate. Um, what, in a nutshell, are the, is the main take home of the book, just so people have a have a sense of it as we begin, and then we'll dig in deeper. Well, the the basic argument is that it's clear that uh, natural selection um, has, um, by modifying our genes, has um, has shaped the structure and function of our bodies. Everyone knows this, uh, and uh, has also shaped the structure and function of our minds, and hence our behaviors. But the argument I make in Blueprint is that natural selection has also shaped the structure and function of our societies. It's shaped how we live together. It's endowed us with all of these, these properties. And there are eight key properties that I call the social suite. They include love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and uh, social networks. Uh, there are these eight things that we are sort of genetically programmed is not exactly the right word, but that's the essence of it. In other words, these are, these are qualities that are encoded in our genes, that we are impelled to manifest, that, um, that we express between 
people. So I'm, I'm not focused on social qualities. For example, uh, you could be brave by yourself, mm -hmm. right? You could be brave in fighting against an animal or, or coping with a, a natural disaster. Uh, that's an individualistic quality. But you can't really, uh, you know, befriend yourself. You have to befriend another human being. So, so the qualities that I'm interested in, these social qualities or these properties, are qualities that we express inter-individually. Uh, things like friendship and love, for example, or cooperation. You can't really cooperate with yourself. You need another human being to cooperate with. And it's all of those qualities that um, allow us to live socially that I'm focused on. And, and, and here's the thing. If, if, if every time I came near you in, our, in the ancestral past, if, humans, if a human being came near another human being and that other person lied to you or, or injured you hmm. or uh, took your, your things or killed you, you would be better off. We'd be pumas. Yeah, we exactly. Or some other solitary that's, that's exactly right. We would have exactly. We would have. We would have evolved to live in a solitary fashion, but that's not the kind of animal we are. We live socially. Therefore, the benefits of a connected life I see. must have outweighed the costs, evolutionarily speaking. Right, and so therefore, in your estimation, despite whatever horrors humans yes. have created, have undertaken collectively against one another, still ought to be in the grand ledger outbalanced by yes. our capacity by Yes, in the grand ledger, I think absolutely they are. That's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about your own individual and social journey to the topic. Um, I was struck by the scope of research in this book, but also your own education and career. You're, you have advanced degrees in, you're a physician, in public health, a doctorate in sociology, like Actually, what compelled you to accrue many more graduate degrees than you needed? <laughs> or maybe you didn't need them all. Uh, well, uh, w uh, you know, I, I grew up in a household where um, my mother was seriously ill. Uh, she was diagnosed with a, 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 a type of cancer that back then, in 1968, was fatal. Um, she lived for 19 years until I was 25, and all of our... all of all of her sons, whatever other interests they may have had, all became doctors. So from, from the time I was a teenager, I wanted to be a doctor. And actually, initially, I wanted to be a reconstructive surgeon. I wanted to reattach severed extremities. And I, I went to medical school uh, to do that. But very quickly, I realized that that was not going to be uh, for me to be a surgeon. Um, and previously, I had had also an interest in, in the biological sciences, and I had an interest in the social sciences. I had a variety of interests. And during, in, in, the, in the summer of 1987, when my mother was very sick, I, I knew I couldn't be in medical school. I was at medical school at Harvard Medical School in Boston, and she was, we, I grew up in Washington, D.C. I knew I wouldn't be able to help in her terminal phase uh, if I was fully engaged in medical school. So I decided to uh, take a year off for medical school and get a master's in public health degree, which had a much more controllable schedule. And that rekindled that experience of being getting an MPH where I was taking classes in epidemiology and the history of medicine and medical ethics and so forth, rekindled my interest in the social sciences. And then I knew that if I was going to, uh, to uh, be a professor, as I had hoped, and, and, and do serious science, I knew that a medical degree was not enough. So I needed to get a PhD in something. And then again, for serendipitous reasons, which probably I shouldn't go into, uh, as I wound up picking sociology. Uh, and then I, I, and I, I finally completed my medical training and my formal education in 1995 when I was 33. So I, I ha did a lot of school, yes. Um, but it's nice that you've been able to take advantage of that, of that research so widely. It's also interesting, I think, that your own individual story turns out to be social. Like yes. We tend to think of individuals making choices that determine the course of their career, but no, we're they all of really us aren't. creatures. No, we're all of us creatures of serendipity in life and social influences. And social influences, yeah, and absolutely. Um, and then, what brought you from medicine to network science? Well, what happened was I, I, my first job uh, was uh, in, at the University of Chicago, and I was jointly appointed between the Department of Medicine and the Department of Sociology, and for my clinical practice. I had kind of returned to my concern for caring for the terminally ill. So I'm, I'm a hospice doctor. I was trained as a hospice doctor, and, I, and that's what I did clinically. I took care of people who were dying. 
And um, part of that was motivated by a kind of moral compunction because, I don't know if the listeners know this, but Americans die badly. They still die badly. Years, decades on, uh, roughly 50% of Americans die in pain, for example, which is appalling in our great nation that we have that type of exit from life. We're a rich country. Yeah. We have excellent health care. And uh, about a third of Americans lose all or most of their life savings in caring for the first person to die in, in the family. So people are impoverished when, when the first person in their family dies. So there are all of these adverse um, parts of death in America that really animated me when I was a young doctor, and I wanted to do something about it. So my first job was as uh, a hospice doctor, and the initial research I was doing was all about how to improve the care of the dying when I was in my 30s. And was hospice still sort of new at this point? Or? Hospice was very new. Uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, there was uh, the, the sort of a, it, there, there did exist hospices in the United States in the 90s, but it was becoming more professionalized rapidly. Uh, there was some revisions in the Medicare benefit for hospice. There was a lot of ferment then in this field. Um, and I, um, uh, so I, you know, I, I really wanted to uh, help care for people who were dying and, do, and improve uh, also the care of the dying more generally. So in my lab at the time, I was doing a lot of research on uh, uh, improving end-of-life care, different kinds of projects, trying to figure out how to have better public policy, better clinical delivery, mm -hmm. the epidemiology of death, that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and I sort of began to get kind of depressed uh, and and I was uh, I was just relentlessly immersed in death and dying. Uh, clinically, I was taking care of people who were dying. I I, I had a very I, I practiced on the south side of Chicago, which was a very predominantly poor African American part of uh, of the city, and uh, you know the conditions were not great actually. And and people are dying young in some cases. Well, some yes. Well, this is another whole story, and we could talk about that if you're interested. But and and, and so in my lab, I was studying. Um, uh, you know, clinical improvements and how to take care of the dying and so on. And I had gone to England where I visited St. Christopher's Hospice, where the modern hospice movement uh, started. And I had met with this very famous woman who had started it called Cicely Saunders. And uh, as part of my time there, I, I met a man who um, told me that the Bureau of Vital Statistics in England, they used to joke, was called Hatch, Match, and Dispatch, <laughs> Birth, marriage and death, right. hatch, match, dispatch. And uh, so I, I come home after that, and my wife, my beloved wife Erica, comes to me, and she says, you know, can't you study anything else other than death and dying? <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't study birth. I mean, I had no expertise. But I thought, well, maybe I could study match. Maybe I can study marriage. Right. So I shifted my research agenda to start studying the widowhood effect. Why, when, uh, when, when one person dies, their spouse's risk of death goes up dramatically right, which is for the first six months, right. especially in men. Uh, yeah. Men have more of a widowhood effect than women do. Um, so I started studying that, and then something very unexpected happened one day uh, in the late, late 1990s is that uh, I had uh, gone, in this, we used to have these old cell phones that were like the size of bricks, and I had gone to um, a, a patient's home, and um, the woman was dying of uh, dementia, and uh, and her uh, her uh, daughter had been caring for her, and she was exhausted from caring for her mother. And the daughter's husband was very uh, distressed and depressed about his wife's predicament. And uh, and the husband had a, a, a close friend. I'm actually I may be garbling the precise sequence of relationships at the moment, but that's the gist of it. And I was driving home from having done this home visit, and I get a call from this person. And I suddenly realized an obvious fact, which was that the woman who was dying was creating ripple effects of, of illness, not just to her spouse right. or her daughter, but to the daughter's husband's best friend, who was calling me about right. his friend's predicament. And so I suddenly realized in that moment that these, these things that I had been studying, these, the, the widowhood effect, which was just a, the, the effect of illness in one person on, the, on, on illness in another, was a special case of of social network, a broader right. social okay. network phenomenon. And I guess that's kind of a good introduction to what social network science is. Uh, what's your best way of explaining the field? Because well, most it's not people one that nowadays people intuitively understand exactly what it means. Well, what's interesting is most people nowadays, because of social media, have seen these images of networks. You have to remember in the 1990s, there was a science of, of the study of social networks that goes back 100 years. And so uh, I had been taught about social networks in graduate school. But the 
people on the street hadn't didn't have a visual impression of what networks were. So you know, it's like uh, networks are are have two elements: they have individuals, the people, and the the ties that, that connect right. them. And uh, the pictures of them have little dots and lines. Right, and they can be visualized in all sorts of interesting yeah. ways. Now, especially new visualization techniques are probably better. That's true. But the point is that now the person on the street has seen such images. Right. Right. Like most people, when I'm talking about networks, have a visual image of what a network looks like. They, they're in billboards. They're, they're they can map their networks on uh, on on Facebook. You know, mm -hmm. they can see it. Back then, though, this was a a, a great novelty, and so um, so so yeah. So I had learned about. Uh, networks uh, as part of my training, and then I kind of began to see that that these widow, these dyadic effects between a husband and a wife, uh, or two partners, whatever their uh, sex, uh, uh, was um, uh, was a special case of a broader phenomenon, and and so that's then I was off and running, and basically for the last uh, twenty two years, that's what I've been studying is human social interrelationships in the form of networks, and the range of findings are really extraordinary, and I'm sure I only know a portion of them, but um, I was struck partly by the range of behaviors that can be contagious that we think of as individual. So there's some things that are easy to imagine are, are self-evidently contagious or influenced by others. Musical tastes, fashion, food likes fashion. Germs, like COVID. Um, but you know, in your estimation, you found suicide, obesity, um, even back pain. Yeah. Uh, what are some of them that s surprised you, and how do we how do we even really understand that? Well, there 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 are two there there are two broad ways in which we are affected by the social ties around us. It, actually, there's more than two, but the two key ways are contagion effects, like you just mentioned, and also connection effects. So contagion effects is just the basic realization that when I affect you, that effect doesn't stop with you. You can go on to affect others. And therefore, I indirectly could come to affect many people. I quit smoking. It changes the probability that my friends will quit smoking. And so, uh, so they then might quit, or at least some of them might quit, and, they, and those individuals in turn might affect their friends. So when I make a positive move in my life, it can ripple out for me and affect, depending on the outcome, uh, a few or dozens or sometimes hundreds of other people. So we have done many studies and many experiments over the years, large field trials with tens of thousands of people. For example, we've done research showing that we can go into villages in the developing world in, in India or in Honduras, for example, and, um, and uh, teach a few people something and then trace out how the knowledge that we've given those people spreads and affects the knowledge and behavior of the whole village just from the targeted individuals. So, and can it therefore make sense to map before you design or undertake an intervention to figure out who the in influencers are, so to speak, in yeah, any given network? You, absolutely, so, what, so you could do that. You don't necessarily have to do that, mm -hmm. but if you're, from a scientific point of view, if you're trying to trace out the, the, um, the uh, contagion effects, it helps to know the structure of the, of the, of the ties. Uh, another way that everyone will, listening will appreciate is, the, is COVID. So, for right. example, you may, early in the epidemic, you might not have COVID, and your friends might not have COVID, but your friends' friends' friends might have the virus. And the fact that those individuals, unknown to you, who are, you know, four degrees of separation from you, your friends' 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 friends, are ill, means that the virus is inexorably going to wind its way through the network and reach you. So your fate is connected to the fate of these people that you don't even know you know, that are far away from you in the network. And it's not just with viral illnesses that that's the case, it's with so many things that that's the case. Uh, so, so germs flow within networks, uh, money flows within networks, emotions flow within networks, knowledge and ideas flow within networks, uh, behaviors flow within networks. To differing extents depends on the phenomenon, but the general principle that there is a flow uh, through the network is, is absolutely the case. And so, but understanding it, studying it, exploiting it, it's not easy, it takes effort. All of those are contagion effects. But there's another way we're affected by networks as well. Uh, it, we're not just affected by what's flowing through the network, we're actually affected by the structure of the network. And I can, I can give a metaphor for that, which I think is, is helpful, and that's the metaphor of carbon. Uh, and as most people learned in high school chemistry, um, there are a couple of, at least a couple of forms of carbon 
You can arrange the carbon atoms one way and you get graphite, which is soft and dark. Or you take the same carbon atoms and arrange them another way and you get diamond, which is hard and clear. Right. And, uh, and there are two key intellectual ideas there. Uh, the first is that this, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness aren't properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. Right. Again, not the individual, but the That's social. right. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Take the same carbon atoms, connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect them another way, you get a completely right. different set of properties. And it's the same with human groups. You can take a group of people and connect them one way, and they're really sweet to each other. Or take the same people with their same inclination to be nice, but connect them another way, and they're mean to each other. Which means that the properties of niceness and meanness aren't only properties of individuals. They're properties of groups that can arise from how the pattern of connections. I'll give you one more example. Uh, a very simple example. Uh, a, a, a sociologist colleague of mine by the name of Peter Behrman and one of his colleagues looked a study, did a paper where they looked at suicidal ideation in, in girls, which is a big problem nowadays. We have a, a, a rising problem. mental illness. Yes, yeah. it's a worsening problem. This is an old paper that they did, and they looked at the, the structure of the friendships in, in groups of girls. So imagine that you have uh, a, a Becky, and Becky can have two friends, Susie and Jane. And and so you have, here's Becky, and here's Susie, and here's Jane. And now there are two possibilities. Susie and Jane can be friends with each other, or they might not be friends with each other. We still have Becky, Sue, and Jane. The only difference is whether there are structurally, the pattern of structural right. connections. And it turns out that suicidal, that Becky is more likely to consider taking her own life if Susan and Jane are not friends mm. than if they are friends. Because In other words, you need that those people to be checking on you with each other. That's, well, that's Possibly. one. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. Or more, uh, another theory is that it's stressful to have your friends not be friends with each oh, other. okay, sure. So there are a variety of mechanisms, but, but the point is that... Especially this, for adolescents. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the point is it's, it's not who Becky, Susan, and Jane are. It's the pattern of connections that affects okay. Becky's fate. It's not whether, for example, ideas about how to take your life are flowing through the network. Uh -huh. It's just the actual structure that might matter. So, so these, these two broad effects, contagion and connection, are, are fundamental aspects of human experience. And, 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 and I'll say one more thing. The, the particular pattern of connections, like if you think about it, most people, uh, we've studied this actually. We've looked at historical evidence and we've also studied this. We've, we've mapped networks all around the world. We've mapped networks among the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. We've ma mapped them amongst the Nyangatom in Sudan. We've mapped them in India. We've mapped them in Honduras. We've mapped them in the United States. We've, we've gone all over the world and we've mapped the structure of human social networks. And again and again, that structure is the same and is mathematically the same. There's like a deep fundamental aspect. And, and people should appreciate this because they, for example, the, one of those stories I always tell is, if you could have talked to my Greek grandmother, who grew up in southern Greece 100 years ago, she was a girl, more than 100, and you asked her, well, when you were a little girl, when you were 10 or 11, how many friends did you have? She would say, I had one or two best friends, and there were four or five of us, four or five of us girls that were close. And if you could ask my daughter... And a bunch of other acquaintances. Yes. But right. if you could ask my daughter Lena the same question when she was 11 and she had an iPhone in her pocket she would give you the same answer. I have one or two best friends, there are four or five of us girls we hang out. So there's something very deep and fundamental about our proclivity to friendship, our capacity to have one best friend or two best friends. Most listeners know what I'm talking about when I say this, and a small group of intimate others. That's encoded in our genes, sure. that practice. And, and, and as a result of that, we, uh, we come to make these, uh, uh, these networks. I forgot what I was gonna say. I was gonna say something else, but I forgot. Anyway, go well, on. I'll ask you a question kind yeah. of on the research and both the contagiousness and the structure of the networks. Like, how do you control for all the possible confounding variables that, say, in the case of Becky and her two friends, you know, maybe yes. Becky is depressed because she was not good at finding the right friends, yes. or maybe someone who is, has bad eating and health habits tends yes. to congregate and befriend people who are yes. not. So how do you try to isolate those? So there are ways that can be done statistically, but what we, for the last 15 years, we've been doing experiments. So for example, on the, on the connection issue, you, what you can do is, is you can, um, you can uh, create a laboratory online 
where you recruit real people to come into this online uh, laboratory, and then you experimentally manipulate the structure. So for example, you could make a pattern of ties this way and a pattern of ties this way, and you drop people into this pattern or into this pattern, and now you introduce people to their immediate neighbors, like these are your friends, quote unquote, these are the people you're gonna interact with, and not everyone in this group interacts with everyone else, each person interacts with some different subset. And uh, then you say, okay, now I'm going to give you something called a public goods game, which is a kind of a model, a kind of game that people can play that invites them to be nice or not. Mm -hmm. they, can, they can either be nice to each other or they can t abuse or take advantage of each other. And they start playing this game. And, uh, and you can then experimentally change the structure of the network. You can make it this structure or this structure and see in which, where do the humans fare better. And, you, and, and we've done that, and we've shown in, in a number of ways that how the structure matters. So you can do experiments is the answer, and be certain uh, by virtue of doing the experiments that that's both, the cause. Both experiments, small experiments in the lab with physical people yeah. and gigantic ones. Well, the gigantic ones, it's harder. That was a with connection online experiment. online and so on. Well, it's very difficult to manipulate people's face-to-face -face connections experimentally. Like, you can't order people to befriend each other or defriend each other. You Not can't, anymore. Not yes. with human subjects boards. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you can't, you can't order people to marry or divorce each other. So to manipulate people's real face-to-face -face interactions is difficult. But there's some exceptions, things like Alcoholics Anonymous groups, mm -hmm. uh, military companies, uh, in, in employment situations, you know, you can uh, form work groups uh, and say, okay, these people are, you know, and, and you, you could do some experiments. And there are some. People have done such experiments where they've experimentally manipulated the structure of human interactions. Uh, but it's harder to do that face-to-face. -face. So the, the, the experiments that we do face-to-face uh, -face on a large scale uh, say, okay, let's just accept that the structure of interactions as we find it, for example, in 30,000 people in Honduras, which is what we've done, but let's experimentally see whether we can manipulate the flow of ideas in this system. So are there, are there things we can do that optimize the ability of these villagers to take to breastfeed their children, to vaccinate their children, to, to use clean water and so yeah, on. Yeah, okay, so how does that, I mean, you've had some measurable success in breastfeeding, which is so important for yes. infant nutrition and, yes. and survivability. Yes. Um, explain how the interventions that were informed by network science were different than traditional public health well, interventions and, and what made them successful. So what, what, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to invent new educational interventions. In other words, what we're trying to do is not figure out a better way to teach you to do something for yourself. Mm -hmm. We find other scientists who've prepared educational interventions, and those scientists have shown that if, if I teach you know, Richard something, he's going to be more likely to do it. Or if I teach Susan something, she's going to be more likely to do it. Okay. What our experiments are looking at is who should you teach within a village to maximize the spillover effects. So our experiments are not about enhancing the actual the public health. It's not about the actual public health educational intervention. We ideally want someone else to have already shown that uh, this intervention works in the people that you give it to. What we're trying to figure out is like, okay, instead of giving it to everyone in the village, maybe you only need to give it to these 10 people and because of where they're located in the network, they're, they have, they're structurally influential. And if you teach those people to do it, everyone else will copy them. And we're talking here about, we're not talking here about like influencers like in social media. Well, although I'm sure there is, are advertising implications of your research uh, too. There, there are, but, <laughs> but, but influencers, the, the thing is these, these influencers online, they're not actually the same. It sounds like the same thing, but it's not. Oh, I Those see. Those people are, they are exercising a kind of broadcast power. In other words, it's like they're, they're sending a message to each of many people. Mm -hmm. They're like sending out a broadcast message. We're, we're talking about something more organic that we do in my lab. That, that, I see. That, you know, for example, if you want to decrease bullying in schools or decrease absenteeism in workplaces or improve safety practices in hospitals, you want to get some doctors to or nurses to to behave in a certain way that changes the culture of those organizations. That's what we're doing, and we've we've done it repeatedly. Well, I was struck reading your work um, by how much we tend to try to treat problems individually. Yes, um, we treat 
and some of them seem kind of you might intuitively realize that treating depression or obesity or even diabetes individually might have some problems, but your work really suggests that you know all of these interventions really ought to be considered. I mean, I mean, are we treating a whole range of ailments and social problems individually when we ought to be addressing them socially? Yes. Well, uh, well, first of all, there are two ways. There are many ways you can address a problem socially, whether it's gun violence or poverty or diabetes or 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 mass vaccination. Uh, only some subset of those are truly network uh, interventions. But absolutely, you're right. Many of these phenomena are not individualistic a at all because we evolved to be social. We're social animals. We're influenced by other people for everything, basically. And, uh, and so, therefore, I think that there are, for many social problems, adopting a network perspective and designing interventions that take human interrelatedness seriously gives us new tools to more effectively deal with those problems. You know, it's like trying to change the culture in a classroom uh, by interacting with one individual at a time. It's, it's not the same as trying to mm -hmm. have a collective. I'll, here, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say I, I gave you 10 smokers and I gave you $100 and you're going to try to get those smokers to quit. Uh, and in one intervention, you spend $10 on each smoker and you see them one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to spend $10 on you. I see you. I the next person, I spend $10 on them, and so on. That's one way of approaching the problem. Another way is you bring all 10 smokers into the room, and you spend all $100 at the same time on some kind of group intervention. You should have the intuition that those two interventions, one of them might work better than the other. Maybe they work the same. Maybe they, maybe neither right. of them work. But it's like, oh, same amount of money, same smokers, different strategy for intervening might have different effects. Maybe when I treat the people one at a time of the 10 smokers, I can get you know two of them to quit. But if I bring them into a group and spend all $100 at the same time, maybe I get five of them to quit. What if you choose the person who's most charismatic? Exactly. Of Even the better. Then I might be able to treat 1,000 people with $100. So I form 10 groups, and I only spend $20 on each group. <laughs> right. So I, you know, I, I get uh, two of the people to like, do something which the others want to copy, and then I can treat 500 people for the same money. That's exactly right. And what are some example, like concrete examples of real-world successes that have taken this network approach to behavioral Well, we just did a study in, uh, in India, which we just published uh, in uh, this past summer, actually, in 2022, uh, uh, looking at iron deficiency anemia in mothers and children. And iron deficiency anemia is a huge problem around the world uh, in neonates and in, and in women and uh, newly pregnant women. You know, the, everything in the baby's body comes from the mother's body. Right. So if the baby needs calcium or iron, guess where the baby gets it? Uh, and so, you know, women's bodies are very burdened by the act of producing a baby. And um, so they're anemic often afterwards. Uh, sometimes the babies are anemic. And uh, this is, can cause cognitive uh, problems. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a serious health, public health problem. What we did is, is we went to um, 50 uh, very poor residential units in Mumbai. And we... Um, we had an intervention that encouraged the women to use iron-fortified salt. So just like we have iodine in our salt, just add iron to the salt. So you buy the same salt, you use it the same way, but now in all your food prep, there's iron in your diet. It costs a tiny, tiny amount more, a tolerable amount more. Right. So the intervention involved educating women about the problems of iron deficiency and also encouraging them to buy this kind of salt that would be helpful. And we randomly assigned different, and we, we mapped the networks of 2,500 female heads of household in 50 different residential units. And in some residential units, we picked 20% uh, of the women at random. In other residential units, we picked 20% of the women according to who had the, the most connections. Uh, and in a third uh, residential unit, we picked them in this other sneaky way, which uses something called the friendship paradox. And then we um, gave them all the same intervention. And then we tested not just the not just the impact upon the women who were given the intervention, but the whole network, but the the larger whole network. network exactly. And we found that in these residential units where we use this sneaky way of picking particular women to educate, very large numbers of people adopted the iron fortified salt. Whereas in this other situation where we took some equal number of women at random, many fewer people did. Wow. Um, amazing. And some many implications for vaccination, for example. Yes. I can imagine during COVID, did any countries try this as a? Well, 
Um, it is mathematically um, absolutely the case that if vaccines are scarce, you would preferentially wish to vaccinate um, popular people. Right. And uh, but it is politically very difficult <laughs> yes, I can imagine. To, to do that. But 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 it's worth thinking about the for just a moment. Popular people would think it's an amazing idea. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, but it's worth thinking about for a moment because we did have this debate in our country and in, we had variants of this debate. So first of all, if, if vaccine doses are scarce for a communicable disease, it makes no sense to give a vaccine dose to a hermit. Right. Someone who's socially isolated, right. interacting with There's nobody. There's different you're, reasons for that. You're wasting right. the vaccine on that person. Right. You, you want to give the vaccine to the people who are who are popular also because it's that's they are the conduits for the spread of the virus and more likely to get it more likely to get it and more likely to transmit right. it so inoculating them stops the spread of the virus and this is for many respiratory diseases this is the tension that also came up in a lot of our political debates and in a lot of our public health debates between whether we should vaccinate the young or the old mm -hmm. so the old were at greater risk of dying so one argument is we should, if the vaccine is scarce, in order to save lives, we should give the vaccines to the elderly. And that's the one that generally prevailed in the U.S. That is the one that generally prevailed. And it's also to the person on the street, this seems very logical. Right. But you actually could potentially have saved more lives by vaccinating the young who are out and about. Right. And the elderly are at what is called at the end of transmission chains. So by vaccinating people who have many social interactions, namely the young who go out right. to work and then come home, so the, the number of interactions a younger person has is they are more popular is much higher than an elderly person which i guess too is why the school closures debate is remains unresolved even, well the, even though it was had quite negative effects for educational outcomes yes it did in the end and we kind of expected it would have but the family member mortality effects might have been significant well this is the thing one, the one thing that's misunderstood about school closures is that the reason we close the schools in this particular virus, as everyone knows now, the young are spared. So in, in, right. in, in, we didn't close them to keep the young from dying. And in fact, for many respiratory viruses, the young are spared. If, of course, if, if the virus had, there are other viruses which kill the young and spare mm -hmm. the old. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, everyone would have been clamoring to close the schools in that sure. situation. But the reason you close a school is to reduce social mixing. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, when you close a school, you force the parents to stay home. Right. And you stop lots of people from congregating at the schoolyard twice a day to drop off and pick up kids. So the, the, the impact of school closures is primarily not about stopping the kids from getting infected. It's from stopping the transmission chains between kids. So in other words, I, I have the virus. I give it to my child. My child isn't sick from it, but gives it to your child, who also isn't sick, so, sick from it, who gives it to you and you die. Right. So stopping the school stops that transmission chain, even though both of our kids were fine. I've now caused your death via our children. So this was and this was well understood even before. So there was a lot of false discourse. People were saying, well, the kids are kids don't get covid. So why are we closing the schools? Mm -hmm. Well, um, because the, the, we weren't closing them to keep them from right. getting it. But the problem with that also on the other side, people said, well, we are imposing a very unfair burden on children to save the elderly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true, too. We, we, and we, as a society, we should have had a more open and frank conversation about this. What are the costs of doing this policy? What are the benefits of doing this policy? And public health is always a cold, utilitarian calculus. Right. And then we would ideally have tried to estimate all that and said, yes, we're going to close the schools despite the cost because we're going to save lives. Or This many. Yeah, more lives. Or no, we're not going to close the schools because the benefit is is uh, is smaller than the cost. Right. So, um, what kind of what have new technologies? What sort of studies and findings have you been able to undertake with higher computing power and the internet connectivity of us all that you couldn't have when you started researching social networks, say, yeah, so, twenty years ago. So. Um, you know, in the in the nineteen sixties, there was a famous exchange among some social scientists about, you know, could you bring an army into the laboratory? You know, could you could you study the function of large groups of people? And the and the decision was no, you can't. Right. That, you know that you need different kinds of methods to study that. And in fact, even when I first started my uh, training, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, well, I started my training before that, but 
even 20 years ago, uh, if you asked a social scientist, you know, what powers they dreamed of having, they might have said, well, I would love it if we had a little tiny Black Hawk helicopter and it could fly on top of you and know where you are and who you're talking to and what you're saying and what you're buying. Right. And, and if it could do that in real time, uh, nonstop, which, and, yeah. and if we could do that for a whole city of people, uh, that would be unbelievable. <laughs> right. right, which we have. Which we now have. Right, <laughs> everyone has a phone in their pocket which does all of that stuff. So we have data on a vast scale, so-called big data revolution, right. or, or what we call massive passive data, massive passive data. And, um, and, and, and the availability of that kind of data from multiple sources, from phone companies, from, from, uh, from um, healthcare companies, from, um, and other administ sources of administrative data, from uh, social media companies, uh, from um, people voluntarily surrendering their privacy, which happens all the time, you know, on, on websites and so on. Right. All of that data can be uh, taken now and can be used to understand in a very deep way uh, deep questions about human social order. Like how and why do we organize ourselves the way we do? And, and we can trace out the flow of things. Like um, I'll give you one example, very ingenious. Uh, someone was very interested in the flow of money through the system and he um, stamped I don't know if some of you may remember this. This Where's George? Did you ever? In, I had. A, I encountered a bill. He, I don't, he, but I think I've heard of it. Yeah, he stamped. He stamped on on dollar bills. He stamped Where's George? And I, I can't remember the, the the website. It was like www.where'sgeorge.com or something. I made that up. I don't remember. Okay, and people and were it, supposed to if they if got, you got it. the bill, you're supposed to enter the uh, the serial number of the bill, and 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 people happily did this. People, you know, <laughs> right. were cooperating, and he used his data to trace the flow, the movement of money which had never, could never have been done before, right? You needed yeah. all of this modern infrastructure, the internet and so on, to be able to do that. And, and so, and, 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 and we can trace out so many things now, you know, like taste and sh shopping taste. You know, mm -hmm. when, when you buy something, does that affect the, your probability your friends will buy it? Well, I can, first of all, identify who your friends are. I can identify what you're buying and I can trace this out. Now, it's scary. And there are some and lucrative, for and, well, lucrative, but there's some authoritarian governments which are using this for ill effect. Yeah, uh, and and it needs controls, but the te that but the technology is there to allow this. So you know, when it comes to these gigantic data sets of you know phone location data or for a city or Google search habits and yes. so on, like. You still have to have researchers coming up with all of the questions to ask of that data and try to crunch it in such a way that it can give meaningful answers. Yes. But do you already have people working on with artificial intelligence to try to have computers parse the data or even ask questions of the data that you might not have thought of? Or is uh, it, you mean or in is my that, lab? Are we yeah, using or AI? Is that, or do people? Is, or is that around the well, corner? Well, I'm, I'm sure other people are, are doing that kind of work with AI. We, we do a, a different kind of work with AI. Um, so my lab is is not a computer science lab, so we we can't invent like AlphaGo <laughs> or something. Sure. You know, AlphaGo was this unbelievable uh, computer uh, program which could play the most complex human game called Go, mm -hmm. which is much more difficult than chess. And uh, and and the the, the uh, artificial intelligence system they built beat the world champion at AlphaGo. It was a an extraordinary event. There's actually a wonderful documentary about it, which is really wonderful to watch. Anyway. So we can't do that. That's not what we do in my lab. Uh, but, but, but what we're doing in my lab is we're not trying to invent super smart AI to replace human cognition. We're inventing dumb AI to supplement human interaction. Let me give you an example. We're, we're inventing simple AI agents, which when placed within a group of humans in what we call a hybrid system, so you have smart humans who've been infiltrated with some dumb machines, and the question is, well, how do we program those dumb machines to benefit the group, uh, to make the group more innovative, more productive, to decrease racism, for example, in the group? These are online communities? They can yeah. be online. They can also, oh. We've also done work with humanoid robots. I can give you an example of that okay. in a moment. So let me, let, me, let me back up and just and try to fix ideas with a little uh, toy example of this. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, imagine like a digital assistant, like an Alexa. The, the manufacturer of this device um, uh, manufactures it so that it is optimized to interact with 
with you, the purchaser of the device. So for example, when, you're, when you want something from the Alexa, you don't have to say, excuse me, Alexa, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt you. If you don't mind, would you please tell me the weather tomorrow? I try to be nice to Alexa just in case. Uh, yeah, well, I don't disagree with you, but you don't have to be that, you know, obsequious and elaborate in your politeness right. uh, to the machine. You can just say Alexa weather and the machine obediently responds, okay? Right. And in fact, it's designed to do that. And uh, and so 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 here we're talking about the human machine interaction, but what I'm interested in is you bring that machine into your home and then your kids use this machine and they learn to be rude. And they go to the playground and they are rude to other children. Because they were rude to... Because they learned to be rude oh. from the Alexa. So, and you found that to be Yes, we, we've done wow. many experiments like this. So what the point is, is that the machine is changing the human-human interactions. Right. It's not the human-machine interactions. And so... Well, that's and troubling. It, it is. And, 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 and the machine could... Very troubling. And the machine could change the human interactions, the human-human interactions, for better or worse. For example, we did another experiment with, um, with humanoid robots. Uh, this was done with... Uh, spearheaded by uh, Maggie Traeger who's now at University of Notre Dame, uh, and uh, Sarah Sibo and Brian Scazzaletti, a roboticist at Yale. And what we did is we created little groups of, of three humans and a humanoid robot. And the, the group of four was given the challenge on a on little, um, uh, uh, what are those called? The little uh, tablet computers, <laughs> the little tablet computers. And they, and they had to work together to lay railroad track on the tablets. They had to get from point A to point B, and they had to okay. each take turns laying some track. And, uh, and, we, uh, and we varied the programming of the humanoid robot, so sometimes it told dad jokes, and sometimes it did not. <laughs> so the robot was acting as part of the team, but sometimes it told really dopey jokes, and sometimes it didn't. And we found that when the robot told dopey jokes, uh, it changed how the humans talked to each other. It made them more familiar with one another? Yes. It was positive. Yes. So we right. changed the human-human conversational dynamics by manipulating in so a very dads knew simple, what they were dumb doing. way. What? Dads knew what they were doing with those dumb Yes. Jokes, so that's what somehow. I think you and I are going to bond over that. We're going to agree <laughs> over that. But, but that's right. Thank you. Actually, there's a theory about dad jokes. Dad jokes are cross-cultural. They're seen in every culture. There's a new paper just published uh, recently <laughs> that makes the argument that the purpose of dad jokes is to build resilience. That you're toughening up your kids when you tell by teasing them, by telling right, these sure. embarrassing stories. Uh, that it's building toughness. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to stick with that explanation. <laughs> sure. But the point is, we've done a series of experiments where um, we, 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 with online bots, uh, we, we've shown, for example, that we can, we can have a, a, a group of people with an online bot in, uh, interacting online, and, and we can have some very simple programming for this bot and make the group more cooperative. This is work I did with Hiro Shirado, who's now at Carnegie Mellon University. So, so there's lots of ways in which you can imagine AI is going to change our society. The, the, the topic I'm tackling uh, in my lab with, with my uh, the students is the, the issue of how AI is going to rewire us, how we will interact with each other differently because of the presence of AI. Yeah, well, and I mean, I've wondered that in the classroom, um, of course, but what are your, I mean, you know, as as we begin to form deeper relationships with AI, as AI becomes quite effective at cognitive behavioral therapy, for example. Yes. Um, you know, are, do you think those sorts of guardrails can be fabricated that will well, I encourage think, these pro-social, real well, human behaviors? Or well, I think are, are, has your optimism been maintained? Well, I think. I mean, every technology is potentially dangerous. You know, nuclear power is dangerous. Weapons are dangerous. Uh, poisons, which we use to treat cancer, are dangerous if taken sure. away. So, um, so I think we're in a very important moment right now with AI, where it's inflecting, uh, and there are risks associated with this technology. I, I think, as a society, we need to have a conversation about what guardrails, if any, to use for this technology. Uh, but I, I, but I'm optimistic that we will be, we will, we will do it. I think uh, these these so-called large language models are going to explode in the coming years. I think right now they cost like a hundred million dollars to build, and so only the richest companies can do them. I think soon they will cost a billion dollars. I think they're going to be, it'll be like nation states will have certain kinds of models, 
And you, and the way you framed it was, uh, what did you say? You said if these models could, uh, I, I sort of digressed from when I lost the thread. You. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I was. There's all the talk of the careers they could replace, but oh yeah, the careers they could replace. Yeah, thank that you. That cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a kind yes. of. I think they will. Based therapy. Yeah, I think it can uh, do rather well. Absolutely, I think uh, I think there are a lot of things. Like already, there's some people who've tried talking to ChatGPT as a therapist, mm -hmm. and it doesn't do so bad. You know, for a short, brief interaction. It now, if, is it people? I'm sure people will do randomized trials to see is it therapeutic. You right. know, some people will randomize these hundred people with some simple neuroses, or get ten minutes of conversation with ChatGPT every day, and these other people talk to a human who does better. It, it's possible ChatGPT or the next iteration will be phenomenal. It's possible. Or bespoke large language models that are optimized specifically, let's say, for the therapeutic interaction. Teaching. You know, I think a lot, I mean, one of the ironies that was so funny is it, originally it was thought that uh, that the machines would come first for, uh, for uh, sort of working class jobs that required your hands. And people like artists and professors and psychologists, uh, you know, they would be protected. Uh, because they're doing these cognitive right. things. But, but it may be the reverse, actually. It may be that it's, you know, things that require you to be in the physical world and do stuff with your hands, actually those jobs would be more protected. Well, especially as there's now a premium on having a product that's produced with craftsmanship. And well, that's another whole topic, care. right? Like, no, I think, I mean, I don't want to overgeneralize. I think, I think uh, you know, I think we humans are extraordinary and we're not machines and we can do things that machines cannot do. Um, but I think, and I, and I also th think we need to pay attention to whether these machines will, they could potentially improve us. So imagine here what you and I have been talking about how the, dean, the, the psychologists that are going to lose their jobs because of uh, chat GPT type machines, and, and, and that could well happen and a lot of psychologists would lose their jobs. On the other hand, all the people who are now getting more effective therapy may become more productive. Right. So there may be a net gain. Or so many people that don't have access. Correct. To regular Correct. mental health. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So, um, so it's, it's in a way, it's sort of depressing that we're like fobbing off people with mental health issues to talk to machines. But if it actually works, then we may be a net positive. So we don't want to be luddites, right? Right. And and the, so the economy is going to be reshaped by by this technology, not immediately, but for sure in ten years we're going to see a very different kind of um, world. Well, so, and maybe Blueprint, your book, has some lessons for the future yeah. in this respect. I mean, you go all the way back to the dawn of human cognition and social interaction to argue that yes. um, our pro-social behaviors, our formation of friendships, our care for young and teaching them are all favored for survival, and therefore we kind of intrinsically are nicer than we are cruel, if that's a fair Yes. No, I do make this argument, but I think the connection to some of these ideas about our artificial intelligence might be the following one. That any technology that we introduce, especially technologies that are trying to modify our social behavior, if they are designed to be in keeping with the social, the social suite, suite, as you call it, and the, these principles that I discuss in the book, we are more likely to have a utopian than dystopian future. In other words, technologies that try to subvert us having friends or interfere with our capacity for love or that make us more hostile to each other, those technologies are going to lead to, a, unsurprisingly, a kind of dystopian right. future. And we so, see in politics and news and history that it's very, very possible to influence oh, yes. people to form prejudicial and oh, absolutely. violent social I mean, groups. I mean, the basic argument I make is I want to be clear. I'm not naive. I understand. So here's, here's the thing. There are a, a number of scholars, for example, Steven Pinker, who have rightly argued that the world is better today because of the Enlightenment. In other words, during the Enlightenment in Europe, uh, there was uh, a, a kind of a set of philosophical principles that was advanced about the equality of human beings, about democracy. And in parallel to that, a number of scientific developments the discovery of electricity and magnetism and steam engines and all of these things. And those, 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 those philosophical moves and those scientific advances, starting initially in Europe and uh, unevenly applied. I mean, they weren't immediately applied to women. They weren't immediately applied to people of color. Uh, and they were spotty and, you know, 
but but you know uh, sort of the anti-slavery movement principally began as a result as an outgrowth of the Enlightenment. There had been slavery amongst human beings forever for thousands of years. Every group had enslaved other groups. But a really kind of modern anti-slavery movement, which finally almost stamped out slavery, there's still actually shadow slavery today in the world. There are 40 million people, lest we forget, that are enslaved in the world today. There are more slaves in the world today than there were numerically, you know, mm -hmm. back two centuries ago. But anyway, uh, th th these, these, these benefits to human beings arose, it is argued, because of these scientific advances and philosophical moves. And I think that's correct. I think as a matter of science, I think it's that is It's also, you know, demonstrable by evidence. Like oh, yes. The number of people who perished by violence yes. 200 years ago was much higher. Than correct. It's it declining. Even, even if crime rates go up in the 70s and 80s like they did in the U.S., it still was nothing like... That's right. And we're living the longer of because of... In the 1760s or 1770s. That's right. And we're living longer because we're richer. We have clean water. We have... We have, uh, we have cotton underwear. I mean, there are all these things, you know, because of the looms and the mills. You know, there are all of these things that uh, vaccination we have, you know, right. all of these technologies. So all of that is true. But my, argu but, but my argument in Blueprint is that we don't necessarily need to rely on these, on these recent historical forces acting. That, in fact, a, a more powerful, a deeper, ancient set of biological predilections with which we humans have been endowed for hundreds of thousands of years is propelling a good society. So my, my argument in the book is the arc of our evolutionary history is long, but it bends towards goodness. And so how do we bend it deliberately when it comes to public policy and education, for example, or social welfare or or media regulation. I mean, are there? Do you, this, of course, is like stepping into a more abstract conversation about the way the world we wish the world to be, um, and maybe not so practical. But do you have? Do you feel like there are ways that we can work toward creating a society that better reconciles with our better human nature? So and worse and worse ways. Well, I definitely feel like there are different policies we can implement, the policies that we attempt to implement that are, go against the principles of social life that are encoded within our genes are doomed to fail. Um, for example, in East Europe, in Eastern Germany, the Stasi tried to uh, eliminate friendship by making everyone suspicious of everyone mm -hmm. else. And with a lot of effort, they did it for a while, but eventually it stopped. People started befriending and trusting their friends again when the Stasi finally fell. So you can, but that was rightly regarded as a dystopian society, right? right? Where you couldn't trust anybody and, uh, you know, you were worried you'd be, and in fact, after the Berlin Wall fell, I think they found like 50% of East Germans were reporting on even their own family members. I mean, it was a corrupt, right. you know, awful thing. And on the flip side, you could imagine doing things that are sustaining of the kinds of things that we humans desperately need, like love and kindness and so on. But I just need to make clear that the, 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 my agenda in Blueprint is not policy prescriptive. In other uh -huh. words, it's not like a, a cookbook where you can open up and say, oh, well, this is, this is, these are the implications for politics, for modern politics. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm after something deeper. I'm, I'm, I'm after a, an understanding of society's almost regardless of politics. I, I, I'm interested in the following fact that, you know, when you go or, or when you travel, and all of us have had this experience, you travel to another part of the world, and initially the, it seems very alien there. These people eat different food. They worship different gods. They have different politics, and the, the smells in the street are different, and it, this, these people seem so different than us. And then you spend a little time in that country, and you're like, oh, my God, their children play in the streets. The people right. love each other. They look at them they're they're hanging out with their friends and and you come to the realization they they tell jokes uh you they, they they have schools where they teach their young you know you realize that there's there's these deep fundamental aspects of our common humanity that are the same everywhere and that's what i'm interested in well and that's kind of fallen out of favor in some ways for good reasons because so often universalism was eurocentric or no I'm, universalism was understood <laughs> no, no. But yes, I take or your point. In the, in it, the was wrongly, it, it was wrongly pasted as Eurocentric, yes. 
in, in the ways that it was imagined or, yeah. um, you know, and, and imagining the genetic blueprint for society was all tied in once upon a time with, with eugenics and so on, which was a which was thought to be the pinnacle of science in like the 1920s. Yes. But it's, so therefore, you know, there's been so much emphasis on particularity, uniqueness, diversity. Um, well, no, the but, diversity move has, has actually, is groupiness, right? What it says is you're not in an individual. It says you're a member of a group defined by some I attributes. See. And it, it abstracts away your individuality and says, well, I can, I can say, I can, I can form an opinion about what you are likely to believe or what you should believe or how you should act based on your membership in a group, which I think is actually wrong. I think each of us is an individual person, and we have our own identities, and, and we should respect that, you know, the, our individuality. But I think that on the, um, this issue of universalism, many Eastern religions have the same principles. It's not just a Eurocentric thing. This notion of one, our common humanity, that we're all mm -hmm. one people, that we're all the same, even if you want to get religious about it, the same before God is a very, you know, widely, not universally adopted, but it, it's, there's a lot, but it's a wide idea that has an ancient history in many parts of the world. Uh, for me, I find that a very appealing philosophy, uh, going back to almost where we began our conversation. I mean, I think it's, I, I would rather privilege our common humanity. I would rather focus on the ways in which we are uh, like each other than unlike each other. I find that a, a sounder footing for for our politics. I found that I find it a sounder footing for our interactions with each other, and um, and I find it a more pleasant way to live. To imagine that we're all human beings. We're all soft on the outside, and um, we have by and large similar desires, similar worries, and um, and that this this feeling this way and and recognizing this reality provides a vehicle for us to understand each other better and work in common purpose. I was, I was thinking about your book even in annoying traffic this morning um, because you can conceive of your commute as a kind of competitive zero-sum game in which people cut you <laughs> off and you're irritating and you yell at them. And Why you, are they on the road? Yeah. Or you can think of it as kind of an amazing cooperative endeavor in which everyone is trying not to get where they're trying to go. They're well, trying to not crash with you. Sometimes you save them from crashing if they change lanes and you tap your brakes. Other times, they save you from crashing. Um, and it, one really can bring a more positive mindset to the all sorts of social enterprises. And I, I well, think it's sweet the way that your book encourages us to do so in a certain sense. Well, one of my, the story you just told evokes in me a memory when I was, um, when I was in medical school I, uh, at the time I, I was in Boston, and um, I uh, was, was struggling with trying to regulate my own attitude towards adversity uh, in the world and in my own life. And uh, there was a scientist, I think at MIT, that was doing a study of uh, Buddhist monks' brains and the discipline mm -hmm. for meditation that these Buddhist monks have, and was it reshaping their brains? MRI machines had just been invented. They were interested in, in, in looking at uh, different regions of the brain and the size of the brain. And, um, and these monks have a, a, a meditative practice of, um, of reframing events always to be positive. So they, they, they train themselves to see the good in the world. And they train themselves to, uh, to um, re-narrate what's happening in a positive way. And, uh, and, and so they were interviewing one of these uh, monks. And uh, I, I pulled over to listen to this guy. I was so affected. I was, I don't know how old I was. I was 25, and I, I was like, it was on an NPR show or something. And I, <laughs> I pulled over to listen to this interview because I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And, uh, and, the, and, and, and so, the, so the interviewer asked the monk, uh, well, what would you do if you were driving and, and someone cut you off in traffic? Wouldn't that irritate you? It's a very Boston kind of question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you Driving know. in Boston is difficult. Yes, exactly. Wouldn't that irritate you? And we all know that experience of being irritated. You're in a car, you know, you're, someone does something rude and you're like, you're there to, it's smart to ignore all of that because, you know, road rage is really a stupid way to lose your life. Who cares if someone cuts you off? But anyway, right. so the monk said, without missing a beat, when he was given this hypothetical, he said, well, he goes, I would imagine that there was a, a desperate man driving this car and his wife was in the back seat and she was delivering a baby. <laughs> And he had to get her to the hospital in time. And this baby was going to have a beautiful life. 
and be a wonderful baby. And I'm listening to this oh, man. Wow, I'm saying, is... oh, wow, <laughs> you know, I wish I could do that. And, you know, yeah. I, what a complete change in perspective, right? Um, Anyway, so that your story put me in mind of that experience. <laughs> well, and maybe he inspired you to write this book in a way. It's cool to think yes. that um, that kind of dramatic, positive gymna mental gymnastics that that monk was undertaking actually fulfilled our evolutionary purpose to a certain extent. Yes, I think I think our capacity to um, not only make a good life for ourselves but our capacity to envision a good life for ourselves is itself a distinctive and miraculous feature of our species. You know, we haven't talked about this, but uh, sexually reproducing animals re have sex with each other. They mate with each other. Of course, I should say there's a lot of amazing animal anthropology in the book. Yeah. So, but, and so, um, and, and, uh, and of course we mate with each other too. But we do something else that's extremely rare, is we, we befriend each other. We form long-term, non-reproductive unions with other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. Which often last longer than our romantic our, uh, yeah, our romantic relationship is no. also true. That is also true. Um, but, the, but, but other animals don't do this. Very few animals mm -hmm. do it. We do it. Certain other primate species have friends. Certain whale species have friends. Um, and elephants have friends. And then there's some other unusual, rare exceptions in other parts of the animal kingdom. And this is amazing that we have this capacity. And yet everyone takes it for granted that we, mm -hmm. we have friendships. Uh, we evolved to have friendships. And these friendships are central to our lives. We have all of this psychological and physiological apparatus. You feel good in the presence of your friends. It lowers your blood pressure, makes you feel you can cope with adversity. Uh, those feelings. We those feel good to do something nice for them. Yes, and we often do things for our friends that they don't even know about that are nice, secret things. Mm -hmm. We would happily help our friends. Uh, and, they're, and they're not genetically related to us, right? right. So the, the, the fact that we evolved to have these predilections, the fact that we evolved this psychological and physiological apparatus that supports our capacity for friendship says something very profound, I think, about human beings, very optimistic about human beings. Well, thank you for your optimism. Thank and you for, for your me. research to give credence to that and solidity to that optimism. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's really been a wonderful interview. Um, again, I'm, I'm Robert Perkinson, and we've been speaking um, as part of the Better Tomorrow speaker series. Nicholas is here visiting um, for a UH conference run by UHERO. Um, this visit has also been sponsored by the Department of Economics. The Better Tomorrow Speaker Series is a joint venture of the Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. We have support from Scholar Strategy Network and the Queen's Health System and Ulupono Initiative and um, the Kahala also put you up and <laughs> I hope nicely. Yes. And um, thank you so much. It was really a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.